there again. This is part three of the Saba TV repair series and uh, quite a few things have happened in the meantime. Everything took a bit much longer than expected because of the whole, well, ongoing pandemic and uh, yeah, getting all kinds of parts uh, takes much longer than uh, it usually does. But uh, now the parts have finally arrived and I can continue on this project. Now in the meantime I actually did manage to uh, redo the case of this TV. As you can see it looks a bit different, the colors are much more vibrant and it no longer has that uh, yeah, nitro varnish or nitro paint. I'm not sure how this stuff is really called in English. But it's essentially a uh, paint usually used on instruments, wood back in the day. Getting that stuff off was a fucking pain because you can only scratch it off. You cannot use any uh, like heat treat treatment. You can't really use any chemicals to remove it because that would damage the wood. Now I'm really happy with the way the TV turned out, even though the color is a bit different. I kind of prefer it now more since it makes uh, the wood on it more obvious. But yeah, that's enough about the TV box itself and let's focus on the main thing this video is about and that is the internals of course. Now as I mentioned in part 1 there were quite a few reasons why I can't just plug this thing in and power it up to see what state it is in. For once uh, I have no idea what I'm dealing with, I don't know what the internal state is as we've seen a lot of high, high voltage lines were unplugged. Or at least the main high voltage line was unplugged and that would have been pretty pretty bad. And uh, yeah, it's always essentially a good idea to have a look inside of what you're dealing with and inspect what state are the components in. And the components were in such a shape that if I were to plug this thing in I would either trip my circuit breaker or I'd end up seriously destroying something inside of this because uh, yeah Back in the days you didn't have the fancy new electrolyte capacitors and foil capacitors, you had paper, wax and tar capacitors. Now there of course are a few electrolyte capacitors in there and I have removed essentially all of the capacitors, tested them all. The uh, electrolytes, as you can see these two here, those should still be fine, that's at least what the tester said. And essentially all the other capacitors are bad. This one here has cracked. These are all essentially paper and foil capacitors. Uh, these ones I was recommended to swap out because uh, yeah, they do tend to build up leakage, the Wima foil capacitors. Here we have essentially one of the main culprits which is a uh, paper wax capacitor. Now these will dry out and yeah, if you are going to use a device with something like this that is still in it, it's uh, gonna let so much leakage through that this thing is gonna get ridiculously hot. Worst case, it's gonna explode and catch fire. And uh, yeah, you really don't want that. Other issues are, well, the uh, tar capacitors. And they are all just completely cracked. Yeah, and again, I ended up, when trying to find new replacement capacitors, on a lot of these, like, questionable websites where they will sell you some super old dried out capacitors for your audio equipment and high fidelity sound, which really is a bad idea if you have something that runs on vacuum tubes, has been listed as refurbished, and you're just like, well, it doesn't sound like the 80s now, does it? And people will just end up putting old crusty looking capacitors like these in it. And yeah, it will have more bass, it will sound more different at least. But the issue is you're going to destroy your vacuum tubes in it because these things have so much leakage that essentially you're just grilling the vacuum tubes and, and well, really grilling everything else in the circuitry. So it really is a good idea to not do that and if you have the option, somehow do it with a different device just to get the sound out of it you want. Because, uh, yeah, this was the capacitor was a feature in the first part. Surprisingly, it still has a capacity of, of somewhere around... 0.1 microfarads in the state this thing thing is in this it has completely exploded just spewed its guts all over the place so yeah powering this tv up with this in it would be a really 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 bad idea so yeah i finally have gotten all the capacitors they are very well different at least to say the least 
from, uh, well, <laughs> the ones that were originally in there. But hey, it really doesn't matter. As long as these things have the exact same ratings, and they do, uh, there's going to be no problems, and you're actually going to be in a much better state than trying to find old exact replacement capacitors, which I also ended up finding in various forums where people would just deliberately buy completely crusty old dryer capacitors because they want everything to be as original as possible. Yeah, that is a really, really bad idea, and you don't have to wonder why the thing will last for maybe two years and then just completely destroy itself. Hmm. Yeah, just replace the stuff with new parts in it. It's exactly the same thing, and no one is going to look inside this thing and be like, Oh, well, that's not original. That's, that's going to make it less value. No, no one's going to do that. It's just stupid. Sorry, but it is. So, not only is this thing heavy as fuck, not only does it have a shit ton of vacuum tubes in it, not only is it really well out school and outdated, and I mean black and white, but seriously, who cares? It also has a shit ton of capacitors in it, as you can see. Well, again, it's not really that many, but let's just have a closer look at them. Now, most of these capacitors are in really bad state, and I just thought the easiest way to try and well, figure this thing out is to just uh, take pictures of the sections where those capacitors are, remove them, glue them next to the picture so you essentially know where they are, and just list them all up. It's a bit easier than trying to figure out that uh, big circuit diagram because there were also a few discrepancies in it, and uh, that just made everything a bit tricky and hard. So, well, now what capacitors do you actually need to replace? Well, you have to replace all the tar capacitors, which are these black blobs in here. You have to replace all the paper wax capacitors, which are the red, the brown, brown white-ish things. Maybe the foil capacitors, since those things could also dry out and go bad. And well, that's essentially it. The electrolytes, yeah, maybe, but in my case they were still all just fine. I will test those thoroughly again with a capacitor leakage tester just to make sure that these tin cans in here are still just doing fine. Especially the two big ones which are on the back side of this big panel here. Since, uh, yeah, those are a bit tricky with the values and whatnot. Same, come, uh, same as for the big tin cans in here. Since, uh, yeah, those things are just huge. I'm trying to find a replacement for that would be well, tricky again, and also really expensive, since yeah, these things aren't exactly small. So, with all that out of the way, let's get to the replacements. There we go. These are all the replacement capacitors, with all various values and whatnot. Now, here's a pretty interesting issue that we're facing. Well, we're comparing 1960s technology with technology from 2020. And, well, the thing is, uh, yeah, back in the day everything was much more clunkier, much bigger, much more robust, in quotation marks, and you'll get issues like this. This is 0 0.1 microfarads and 1000 volts of a capacitor. This is a paper wax capacitor. This, so much smaller, it's like less than half. Yeah, uh, it's just a foil capacitor with a thousand volts, essentially the exact same thing. Also a nice thing is that these are not polarized, uh, whereas I believe these are. So yeah, that's also a nice feature, so it really doesn't matter which orientation you put those in, in comparison to these. Well, some progress has been made, and as you can see, we have a lot of new capacitors in this section. This is one of the three pages actually uh, finished now. And uh, yeah, it's a bit tricky and you have to be a kind of bit creative because the new capacitors are so much smaller and they have a different, well, form factor. And getting everything to fit is a bit fiddly. But uh, yeah, now I still have a few capacitors that I'm actually uncertain about if they are still okay or not. And those were these uh, big electrolytes here and here. And uh, yeah, I just have to essentially test those separate just to make sure that those are still just fine because I could not find the exact replacement for them. And one of those capacitors was even so nice that uh, there's essentially no value written on it and I cannot really find anything and the measure is a bit 
well, weird. Uh, so I just want to make sure that that capacitor is fine. But yeah, I think it should be, uh, since, well, the foil, uh, tar, pa tar paper and wax paper capacitors are all the ones you really need to replace. Uh, the others, well, the big electrolytes, mm, often not so much, and you definitely do not have to replace the uh, styrofoam style capacitors, which are essentially these. Those are just gonna be fine as well, since, well, those are completely enclosed and those do not tend to go bad. Some new capacitors are in here as well, and I still have to return two capacitors to the socket. Uh, yeah. And there are a few more, well, styrofoam capacitors in here, a bunch there, and uh, yeah, if you really want to, you can test them, but uh, there's really no point in replacing those and, uh, well, removing them, since those are just going to be fine. And some more progress has been made. We are on the bottom side of the TV, uh, which is really annoying to get to, and there we go. We have our capacitors all replaced. And yeah, uh, you have to be, again, like I said, very creative on how you install these. Because, yeah, they are much smaller. Or uh, the original capacitors were in such a weird way you have to kind of extend everything. Or mount it somewhere differently. Because, well, I cannot get access to that uh, tab down in there. The grounding tab. But hey, since we have another grounding tab up here which is on the same panel, I think that should be just fine. Now, with the results from the capacitor tester confirming that these capacitors in here were still off totally fine, uh, yeah, I could just put those back and I'll leave them in there. There's nothing to worry about. All the others have been replaced since there is no need to really keep the paper wax capacitors in there since, uh, yeah, they're, they're just gonna degrade. Uh, whether they've been used or not, it really just doesn't matter. It would be a bad idea to attempt to reuse those. <laughs> So yeah, but like I mentioned, uh, we have these huge metal cans here in the back and I cannot really test those unfortunately since the capacity of these is so large, it just takes forever to charge them, so... Mm. Oh well, I'm pretty sure that those are just gonna be fine or fine enough to power this thing up for the first time. And I'm gonna power it up by using a variac and slowly adjusting the power all the way up to 230 volts. Just to make sure that this thing doesn't pull ridiculous amount of current the first time I'll actually power it up and just make sure that the stuff that is working is actually working. Which uh, always is a bit of a safe guard to be sure that all the stuff that isn't here works. And is not just gonna blow up everything the first time you uh, attempt to do something with it. Now there's another issue. I still cannot power up this television. Why? Well, uh, yeah, the vacuum tubes. Uh, there are, two, I think, 19 vacuum tubes in it. 20 if you count the actual picture tube. But, uh, yeah, this one should be just fine. I will test it, however, as well, just to make sure that it is fine. Now, I cannot exactly test vacuum tubes properly and see in which state they are, if they're good, if they're bad. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can do, since I don't have a vacuum tube tester, is just make sure that these vacuum tubes do not have any weird shorts. And the way you do that is, well, you remove one of the tubes and just test every single pin on it with a multimeter to, yeah essentially verify that uh, no pin is connected in the cold state and if you power the thing up and it gets warm you can test it again and you will get some diode-like effects. It will become conductive in one way but not in the other way and if it's like that it's fine. If it's uh, then you can test it essentially again after it cooled down again to see if it hasn't developed in shorts. The way I've tested this one and this one is feed the tubes up, let them sit for a few minutes, tested them, got those diode-like effects, let them cool down for a few minutes, or that they're actually so cold you can touch them, test them again, and none of the pins, except for, well, the heater, of course, had a continuity, and that is exactly what these tubes should do. I cannot test their health, unfortunately. Now, when you're working with vacuum tubes, one thing I would recommend is using some rubber gloves, not because of having fingerprints on the tubes or anything, and that doesn't isn't that bad, honestly. The biggest issue I have really is uh, if you see this tube here and you see that nice print on it, uh, this print is powder, meaning uh, this will get dissolved every single time you touch it. And if you have one vacuum tube and a socket that is a bit tricky to get it in, and you're trying and pushing and everything, and eventually the tube slides into the socket, 
uh, all of a sudden the label is gone and you have some white powdery dust on your fingers and now you have no idea what tube that was anymore. I mean, sure, I have the data sheet and uh, the back cover of the TV actually shows me which tube is where, but uh, still, I mean, it would suck if you <laughs> get rid of all these labels on them, so it's just going to be really tricky to identify which tube is essentially what. So yeah, uh, I haven't tested any of the tubes that are on here. Uh, I believe this tube and that tube is the same. Yeah, this is essentially what I mean, that uh, these labels just come off way too easily. I don't know if you will be able to see that. And uh, at some point you won't be able to identify what tube this is anymore, and it's just going to be a pain. So yeah, I'm going to show you how to easily test these or at least confirm that they are still okay to put in a device and not going to cause any trouble. So, here we are. I've got a multimeter that is set to the resistance setting. I've got the vacuum tube and the tube socket. Now, I've connected the heater pins on here, as you can see, and uh, these are essentially just uh, yeah to heat up the heater. These are usually pins 4 and 5, and for this tube uh, you have to check the datasheet since it can be different to what tube you're using. Some of the tubes in there run on 17 volts, and this one here runs on 6.3 volts. The tube is in the socket, the heater is on, it's at 6.3 volts, I'm pulling around 300 milliamps, that's exactly what it should do, just like in the datasheet. And you probably won't be able to see it, but let's turn the lights off and have a closer look at the tube. And yeah, it's glowing and getting warm, just like it should. So, with the tube now warmed up, we can go ahead and start testing it. And the way you essentially can test these is just stick your multimeter probe on one of the pins. This is a bit tricky to do these. Multimeter probes are really, really shit. I, for I forgot where I put my good ones. And uh, yeah. And just start probing away. Nothing, and that's essentially what you should get. Now, occasionally you can get a sort of diode effect, like uh, right here, where it's going to get conductive into one way, but it's a, a few kilo ohms, so that's totally fine. But let's say if I turn this these two around, you can see it's not going to get conductive. That's because one of these is positive and the other is negative. And since we have now a vacuum with the heater on and everything, the tube is going to get conducted even at the low voltages that this thing is running at. I think it's 3 volts or so on the probes, so yeah. And again, another diode effect, but as you can see, it's uh, yeah, the range of mega ohms or 0.3 mega ohms, that's just fine. So, yeah, now I've tested all the pins on here, and as you can see, it, sometimes it will get conductive, but again, it's in the range of kilo ohms or mega ohms, or about there. And that is totally fine, it's also going to be only conductive in one way, if I turn the pins around the other way, as you've seen, uh, it's not going to be conductive anymore. That's just because, well, that's the way how the vacuum tubes work, even with, uh, yeah, even with the low voltages I'm using, this thing is still doing exactly what it should do, and uh, yeah, that is essentially just being a vacuum tube. Now the interesting thing is, I've turned the power supply off, and we're going to wait a few minutes and test this tube again and see if there are now going to be any short stout effects or anything like that uh, in here as well. Because if there are, then something is clearly wrong. In the cold state, nothing except the heater should have continuity. So, the vacuum tube has cooled it down completely. Let's turn the multimeter back on and do exactly the same test as before. And if now we get a short or conductivity anywhere else that's not the heater, then we know that something is wrong with this tube. And 
And again, that is the heater. That is totally fine. And there we go, that's all the pins tested on this thing and we can put the tube back in the TV and this is not going to cause any issues. I mean unless the tube is bad of course, which I can't test since I don't own a tube tester. And those things are ridiculously expensive if you want to get a, a decent one that can test various tubes of essentially any kind. Now testing the high voltage ones is going to be a bit weird, but uh, yeah, it's essentially all the same thing. And with this you can at least test and see if the tubes themselves are somewhat in a state that they will work and not destroy anything. Because if the tubes have shorts or so in them, that could essentially destroy your entire heater circuitry in the whole uh, setup. And that would be really, really bad. We are starting to get to the scary part. I've finished testing all the vacuum tubes in there and all of those are checked out fine. Uh, none of them had any weird short uh, conditions or any of that. All the tubes glow, all the tubes have their silver top and everything. So none of the tubes in this thing seem to be bad. I've also checked the capacitors, everything seems to be in the correct place. And so on and so forth. But I'm not going to plug this thing in directly. And uh, I'll rather use my Variac. Uh, which is a pain to switch on since this thing has no soft starter and it's a 30 amp variac even though I'm only using it with 15 amps that's how much I can only get out of the uh, outlet not that I need any more than that but uh, yeah uh, I've just hooked up a uh, light bulb in series with this thing and uh, that should do it and we are hovering at around 1 volt and it will slowly increase uh, the voltage on here and one, watch the current, see how that behaves. The thing should not go over um, 160 watts. If it shoots above that, something is clearly wrong. I just don't want to plug this thing directly in and have something blow up. Oh yeah, and another thing, I need to have a look out on all of those tubes in there, just to see how they are behaving, especially the stuff in the high voltage section up here. Probably gonna put the camera over here so you can have a good look at that as well and for that I'll actually turn the lights off uh, because otherwise I cannot tell what these vacuum tubes are uh, really doing. Well, this is not good. It's uh, leaking over Earth. Uh, unfortunately, this is not working. Uh, the light bulb is causing too many issues and interference with the Variac. Uh, it's just limiting the current so much that I can only get up to 70 volts, which is nowhere near where I need the, the power to be. Uh, I guess I somehow have to try and get this thing powered up without uh, any inrush current limitation, and that is a fucking pain since this thing has such a huge surge it ends up tripping my circuit breaker. Alright, I had to change the test set up a little bit. Uh, the issue being um, the light bulb caused too much uh, limitation of current and I couldn't get the variac above 70 volts. The voltage drop and power dissipation was just too high. Uh, also, I've calculated how much power this TV should pull and it's 160 watts and uh, just using the basic power formula this is around 700 milliamps at 230 volts. So I also have to use a different multimeter since uh, the scale on the uh, Variac is just too big. It's a 15 amp uh, <laughs> ampere meter analog, of course, and uh, yeah, it's just too huge. It cannot measure that, unfortunately, since I wouldn't be able to see that. Or uh, yeah. <laughs> I, the, the, the smallest amount I can see is uh, 0.5 amps, and that's just too little. So I have to use a multimeter set to uh, yeah, AC and current measuring, of course. And let's plug this bastard in. Okay. I'm gonna turn the lights back off and slowly increase the voltage.
We have 300 milliamps, that's still, still just fine, 100 volts. We are 400 milliamps at 120 volts. The barrack is humming. TV is doing something. We are at 600... Well, what was that? I can do anything. And the tubes are lighting up, all of them actually. That is looking good. But we still have no picture on it. Oh god, this is... This is not good. This is really not good. Oh god. Oh shit, this is not looking good. We have smoke coming out of the high voltage transformer. That is really, really bad. Well, that test was a complete failure. Everything on the low side works. Uh, I even got briefly sound out of the speaker. You can hear the white noise and everything. But there's a different issue, as you've seen. You've already seen the smoke and a few arcs and a even small flame coming out of the high voltage transformer here. So, uh, yeah. If we take a look down there, we can see the chart. So this thing has somehow shorted out and now essentially killed itself. Which uh, really sucks, since uh, finding replacement parts for uh, yeah, six-year-old televisions is a bit of an issue. I mean, everything in here is just fine. I will, however, have to test these three tubes here, since they are working with the high voltage transformer. Uh, after I um, yeah, discharge this thing, since I don't know if it even got that far to charge the uh, vacuum tube there. Uh, hmm. Not so nice, not so nice at all. This really, really fucking sucks. Yeah, now what could have been the cause of that? Well, my guess is uh, someone tried to power this thing up, or did some work on it, and the cable in there came loose. Now, when I got this TV, it didn't have that nice big rubber cup. I was the one who added that. And, uh, yeah, my guess is that this got loose, somehow came against the case, and whoever uh, tried to power this thing up shorted out the high voltage transformer, which essentially killed it. So, yeah, that um, kind of sucks. So, yeah, first power up is a bit uh, unsuccessful. Now I have to figure out where I can get a uh, transformer that is similar to this one, or uh, rewire my own new transformer out of this. But uh, yeah, this is a bit annoying. I'll try and check if I can find an exact replacement part of this, this unit somewhere on eBay. I hope, I really hope I can, since I really want to get this thing to power up. Everything except the high voltage transformer works. Mm. Kinda sucks. So yeah, with the first power up of this TV being completely unsuccessful and showing me that there is a more severe issue than I have thought there was, uh, yeah, there is no way I can really continue now. Uh, my idea was at first to, well, try and get the high voltage transformer apart uh, by l having it lay in some acetone for a few days so I can dissolve all the epoxy that's on it and figured how many turns this thing has. And, uh, well, that did work. I now know how many turns this thing has, and I could theoretically wire a new one. But there's a bit of an issue, and as you can see, every single winding pair, well, is uh, insulated. So, um, doing that isn't really that easy and possible, since you need some special material for that. A sort of plastic, you can't use paper or anything, and uh, yeah, uh, the result I would get would just be not that great. It wouldn't be anywhere near as good as it could be, but I was recommended by a friend of a friend who works a bit more in the uh, TV repair and uh, uh, broadcast uh, section, uh, that there is a completely different way on getting this thing up and running. See, the good news is, is that the primary side of the uh, flyback is still fine. There is nothing wrong with this. 
If you take a close look at it, there is absolutely nothing wrong with it. No indication that it's bad. And I mean, since we did get the high voltage arc, that means that this uh, thing is totally fine. There is absolutely nothing wrong with it. So that is awesome news. So that means we can, uh, well, let's take a look at the schematic and I'll explain what we are going to do. So what we are essentially dealing with is uh, this section of the schematic. And it is uh, this coil right here that has burnt out. So yeah, uh, there's also this uh, high voltage uh, diode uh, in here, which is this vacuum tube right here. But um, with the modification that I was recommended, I don't even need this thing anymore. I can just remove it and there is no negative consequences of removing it. Since usually removing vacuum tubes from any vacuum tube circuitry and powering it up is a really, really bad idea since uh, the entire circuitry expects essentially that there are vacuum tubes installed and if you power it up without the vacuum tubes, everything will go haywire. But if we take a look at this, the tube is nowhere connected to any circuitry at all. And if we take a look at the part of that, or the socket of the tube, we can see we have a loop. We have the connector for the TV. And the tube is actually powered uh, just by that one loop. So we can safely remove, remove that. And uh, that is essentially going to fix it. So here's the new schematic. Uh, I've removed the secondary, the high voltage uh, part of the transformer. I've removed the high voltage diode and uh, everything that belongs to it. And uh, we have a high voltage cascade. That is essentially a voltage tripler uh, thing. <laughs> Something I have not worked with at all, but it's essentially used in uh, more modern televisions on uh, essentially driving the vacuum tube, or the picture tube, really. In this case, I connect one side of it, well, that's labeled to ground, to ground, and the other pin that it has, it goes to the PY88, and that is the socket that is on top. Everything else remains connected, and all that gets removed is the high voltage section of the flyback, and uh, yeah, that's essentially it. Now the thing is still being shipped and thanks to the current ongoing situations everything takes a bit longer. So I'm gonna save that for the next part and hopefully in uh, that video with the first real power up everything is going to work just fine. Now unfortunately I still have to use my Variac for this since I want, still want to make sure that everything works perfectly fine. Uh, this thing still has a bit of an issue with uh, tripping my socket breaker. I have already added some uh, inverse current limitations, but those aren't enough, really. Hmm. But uh, it will turn on if you make sure that it is really in the lowest winding possible. <laughs> Otherwise, the surge is just going to be so high uh, that it essentially trips this socket breaker and the one that is in yeah, my fuse box. So, yeah, that's essentially it for uh, this part of the uh, repair series. And hopefully, in the next video, we get this thing up and running. Sure, it's going to behave a bit differently and what whatnot, but uh, I think that should be just fine. Hopefully, this will work. And for those wondering what high voltage cascade this is, this is the BG1895. And we only have two cables on it, uh, you have to be sure. There's another connection on it for, um, uh, I think that's a focusing feature of the existing circuitry that these things are usually used in, but we're not going to use that since there is absolutely nothing to hook it up to. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And, oh yeah. And for those wondering where exactly is this part in the TV, well, that is the tube, the, and that is the socket it has to connect to as well. And the flyback casing already has, uh, well, it has the connector for the vacuum tube. We have another ground tab up here, so I can hook up everything fairly easily and uh, maybe 3D print a small mount where I can put the high voltage cascade on uh, yeah, here in the flyback, which would be awesome. And then everything would still be contained inside of this middle enclosure that just goes all over all the high voltage stuff. And uh, yeah, the epoxy should be dry by now. So yeah, until then.